I hope that we both hope that by the end of this talk, you're, you are able to comfortably identify potential triggers of autoimmunity and their impact on one's health, to establish the connection between the gut microbiome and autoimmunity, and to provide guidance to patients with autoimmune disease in managing symptoms through lifestyle changes and dietary decisions. So I'm going to start with very basic and as basic as possible, even for me, um, the healthy immune system. So we have innate and adaptive immunity. And I think this is really important to understand where this talk is coming from. So in the innate immune system, we know that we've got bacteria, viruses, fungi, all foreign antigens that are trying to constantly invade in our body. And we have physical barriers like skin, earwax, tears, we've got urine, stomach acid. That's there to block it, but inevitably, sometimes some of this bad stuff gets through the barriers. Our innate cells will try to do what they can to get rid of the junk, and that's on your left right there, the basophils, eos, the neutrophils, mast cells, and NK cells. But sometimes these innate cells need backup, so they call the adaptive immune system. I said I was gonna to try to keep it basic. So adaptive immunity is where we have our dendritic, dendritic cells that gobble up all the junk, present it as antigen presenting cells to stimulate the release of cytokines and present these, this junk to B cells and T cells, which become activated and result in activation of the immune system, okay? And relative to this talk, autoimmunity. So the integrated immune response, and this is busy, but the integrated immune response is going to be a balance on the left of, of your tolerance and regulation, which is going to be your T regulatory cells, your anti-inflammatory cytokines. And then on the right side, you've got inflammation and tissue damage, which is your pro-inflammatory side. So you've got the effector B and T cells and the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So an integrated immune response is an even balance between the ability to use our pro-inflammatory cytokines to attack stuff, and then our tolerance and regulatory side of the immune system to suppress the inflammation. And then in the green circle that you see on the bottom left, you've got all of the factors that help or don't in maintaining this integrated immune response. So the, the, whatever is associated with it, essentially. And that's what we're going to be talking about in the beginning portion of this. So what is autoimmunity? We've got this, but in autoimmunity, you have a tipping over. So on the left, you see now that your tolerance and regulation of the immune system is down-regulated, and you have up-regulation of the inflammatory side of the immune system. So not enough anti-inflammatory stuff and too much pro-inflammatory stuff. I don't want to make this a, a strict immunology talk, so just simplifying it. Now, there are a lot of things that can be associated with this down-regulation of tolerance, um, and that includes your, your impaired clearance of junk, so apoptotic debris, the inability to get rid of all the bad stuff, and then molecular mimicry, abnormal, pre abnormal presentation to self, and overproduction of self antigens, polyclonal lymphocyte activation, and epitope spreading. I'm going to be talking about some of these things, not in detail, but in the coming slides. Now, triggers of autoimmunity, there are a lot. If we kind of blanket it into one group of four potential triggers, it would be genetics, diet, infections, and environmental triggers. I really like this slide as an example of what we look at as far as what triggers, what, you know, what, where does the immune system get flawed? And this is an example of rheumatoid arthritis. So on the far left, you see, okay, on the far left, you see suscept an individual is susceptible to rheumatoid arthritis, and on the far right, there's established rheumatoid arthritis. So you have a healthy joint, and you have a diseased joint, where there's immune cell infiltration, hyperplasia, they've developed this panis, which is where you get the very swollen, it's it's almost permanently swollen joint because of synovial hypertrophy. Now, on the left, your susceptibility to rheumatoid arthritis, these risk factors are initially noted to be genetic. So 60% of the risk of rheumatoid arthritis is genetics. It can be genes like genetic polymorphisms. It can be epigenetic modifications. It can also be the non-genetic risk, risk factors, which account for about 40% of the risk of rheumatoid arthritis. And those non-genetic risk factors include some of the things we're gonna talk about. So smoking, things that we can't control, so gender, ethnicity, but things that Micah's going to be talk, talking about, like diet. So that's your 
susceptibility to rheumatoid arthritis, but not actually having it. So you're just prone to it. Then in your preclinical RA, that's what, when a patient will have an initiation of autoimmunity. So something that you're exposed to. So putting genetics aside, you have an exposure, whether it's smoking, an infection, uh, whether it's some sort of something that has caused a, an epigenetic change. So you've got post-translational modification of something that triggers the immune system. And in rheumatoid arthritis specifically, which I will mention in, in the coming slides, we see citrullination of peptides, which triggers the anti-citrullinated peptide antibody to form in rheumatoid arthritis. So that is where you have an initiation of autoimmunity. An exposure already susceptible triggered the immune system to become activated. It's still preclinical RA. The patient won't have symptoms necessarily, but they might start to once there's a, a an increased level of cytokines as a result of this autoantibody production. The propagation of autoimmunity is what happens thenceforth. So you've got all of these cytokines that are resulting in an inflammatory cascade, <clears throat> excuse me, and then you've got propagation of autoimmunity. And that's where a patient will develop established rheumatoid arthritis, early and then established. So genetic susceptibility, as you see from this prior slide, plays a large role in risk of autoimmune disease. It does not account for all of it, and it is typically multiple genetic polymorphisms that are actually associated with the risk. Unfortunately, we can't tell in, in all cases, so we have got all of these tests now that are available to the public. Black Friday, Target had a deal where you could get one of these genetic tests done to see how high risk you are for whatever disease. We don't really understand what that means because every single person has a different risk. So making a conclusion from what this one piece of paper is telling you is very difficult. But we do know that there are multiple genes that are associated with these diseases. It's very complicated, but the most common things that we find are polymorphisms in, <clears throat> excuse me, HLA and cytokines or cytokine receptor polymorphisms. On the, on the right, you see how complicated it can be. So you've got actually in the middle HLA DRB1, HLA and type 2, which are common to these five autoimmune diseases or diseases that are associated with the immune system. And then beyond that, just subsets of different genetic changes that are seen in each specific disease. Single gene uh, polymorphisms are not common. They are seen in some endocrinologic diseases, but not typical. So this is not meant to bore you, but this is just an example of how genome-wide association studies in lupus have demonstrated that we can identify all these genes, and then we can identify that the genes are acting on which pathway in lupus and other diseases, but in lupus. So we see all of those genes that are associated with lymphocyte activation, interferon or toll-like receptors, inflammation, immune complex or waste clearance, and then all the stuff that's not known. So we see all these genetic associations with lupus, and these patients will be at a higher risk of lupus, but they need some other exposure. It's not going to be just this gene or these genes. Similar with rheumatoid arthritis, so I won't go into the details of this because this is really busy. Environmental triggers include, but are not limited to, UV radiation, vitamin D deficiency, medications, chemicals, toxins, stress, and then Micah will be talking to you about the diet. Essentially what we see in environmental exposures is an individual is exposed to whether it's UV light, for example, in somebody with lupus, smoking in a lot of our autoimmune diseases, certain medications, even a disease, one disease, especially autoimmune disease begets another, stress and so on can result in oxidative stress this can by itself result in the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines that triggers the immune system. So you've got autoimmunity triggered by cytokines alone. And then the reactive oxygen species will also cause lipid peroxidation, soft tissue, cell death, and that presentation of that junk that I was showing you in those first couple of slides that then gets presented to your B cells, T cells, and triggers autoimmunity. So like in lupus, one of the big things we always say is, in lupus, it's an impaired clearance of apoptotic debris. I'm not able to get rid of the bad stuff, so the bad stuff just floats around, gets presented to our B cells and T cells, they take it up and they just result in this forward flow of inflammation. In lupus, we see, uh, uh, we call it the interferon signature as being highly causative or more active and associated with organ damage in lupus. 
And we see that as a consequence of this. Each disease might have a different signature, so to speak, but we see this essentially in this generic pathway explaining how autoimmunity happens in our patients. So vitamin D plays a key role as a natural immune modulator. And I, I think this is getting more hype now, but it's been studied for years now. That it, it has, so it, it does have a role in, in the antimicrobial response by enhancing chemotaxis and phagocytosis. It also acts on CD4 cells to promote the differentiation into T helper 2 and T regulatory cells, which are part of that left side anti-inflammatory pathway and it inhibits T helper 1 and T helper 17, so that pro-inflammatory side. In a, this is a, a study that looked at vitamin D deficiency in healthy individuals and in patients with lupus. So essentially what they did was they, they looked at 32 European American females with SLE and compared them to 32 matched controls, healthy individuals, and they found that those healthy controls that were ANA positive versus ANA negative, we're more likely to have vitamin D deficiency. And in the lupus patients, where we know that interferon alpha is increased and associated with more organ damage and disease activity, and we know that high B cell activation is similarly associated with more damage and more disease activity, they found that lupus patients with high B cell activation had lower vitamin D levels, and lupus patients with vitamin D deficiency had higher interferon alpha levels. So we're seeing it in the numbers that the lower the vitamin D level is, the higher their disease activity is. That's in addition to the fact that vitamin D, D deficiency by itself, irrespective of immune modulation, patients are demonstrating increased fatigue, increased bone and joint pain as a result. Uh, looking at infections and autoimmunity, I mentioned this before, I won't go into the details of this, but some of the concepts of how infections can trigger the immune system include molecular mimicry, a standard or polyclonal activation, epitope spreading, and an auto-inflammatory activation of the innate immune system. Reactive arthritis is one example. Um, so we, we do know that HLA-B27, as a genetic polymorphism, we understand that patients, that 75% of patients with, with reactive arthritis will have HLA-B27 positive. They can also have HLA-B51 they might also have HLA-DRB1. But the actual mechanism by which reactive arthritis happens is still not clear. So we do know that someone might have a GI infection or a genitourinary infection. They may have a bronchopulmonary tract infection. That infection, those are all extraarticular sites, and the infection is believed to spread through the bloodstream as a transporter across the synovial cavity and result in local antigen antibody formation. We recognize that, but beyond that, the fates can be three. So one would be a normal physiologic clearance of something bad. So this is an infection, I don't want it, get out. The other would be tolerance, that you're here, I recognize that you're here, period. That tolerance can actually result in that third fate, which is pathological immune stimulation. So this is where a patient would go on to develop Let's say somebody had chlamydia or somebody just had a GI flu, didn't know what actually caused it, but it might have been Yersinia, so it wasn't actually a, a viral infection. Or they might have had some other infection, and I'm finding this not just in these specific pathogens, but I'm seeing it in people who have other infections too that triggers a reactive arthritis pathway. But they develop synovial inflammation. The right hip is, they've got synovitis, we don't know why. It started about two months after they had a urinary infection. So. This is what's believed to trigger the immune system. So it's kind of like we read about a two-hit hypothesis. Somebody might have a genetic susceptibility, and now they've got a second hit that put them over and, and activated their immune system. I did mention rheumatoid arthritis, and I keep coming to this because we've got a lot of data on rheumatoid arthritis. Now in rheumatoid arthritis, we have found that gingivitis is associated with autoantibody production in rheumatoid arthritis. So porphyromas gingivalis has, is associated with uh, citrullination of an arginine peptide, and that results in the pathway of ACK by antibodies. So that's your CCP antibody that we see in rheumatoid arthritis. Similarly, smoking triggers ACK by production in the lungs. So that is believed to spread to articular sites and trigger rheumatoid arthritis. And then intestinal, I'm trying not to touch on this because Micah's got a whole lot on it. 
Hormones and autoimmunity. So we know that autoimmune disease generally impacts women more than men. The mechanism behind it still is not fully clear. There are concepts, but not fully clear because every disease will be different. We see in lupus that six, for every six to nine women, one man is affected. In rheumatoid arthritis, for every four to five women, one man is affected, and so on. So you see similar findings across the board. Now this is an interesting slide, and I'm only gonna focus on the top half, but high-dose estrogen, so as what we see in, in pregnancy, can, be, can have cytoprotective and immune effects. This paper actually says that it can improve cell-mediated disease, but worse than antibody-mediated disease. I'm presenting this just for your information, but the reality of this, and even in my own clinic, is I don't really know who's going to, who's going to present with a disease flare with excess estrogen versus complete resolution with excess estrogen. And I see this a lot in my lupus clinic because I have patients that will be pregnant and they feel great during their pregnancy. And I actually tell my patients, it's a one third, one third, one third rule that if you're gonna be pregnant and you have lupus, or even if you have rheumatoid arthritis, though I see it more in my lupus patients, you will either be fine and nothing happens, you will flare horribly or you'll actually feel better. I've had patients with rheumatoid arthritis tell me that I wish I was pregnant all the time because I feel great. And others say, I never wanna get pregnant again. So I don't have, anecdotally, I can't explain some of the findings that I see in research. This is, I only brought this slide up just because this is from 1986, it's a JAMA article, where they found, in, they, they looked at non-contraceptive hormones and contraceptive hormones in rheumatoid arthritis in perimenopausal and postmenopausal women. They didn't find an association between rheumatoid arthritis onset and a prior use of non-contraceptive hormones, but they said that there is definitely a protective effect of oral contraceptives on the development of rheumatoid arthritis. And I think we've come a long way from this and we've realized that we don't really know as much as we think we do now. Um, I mean, it's, it, this, a lot of this data is what triggered all of this research in this field, so. Okay, so this is something that I'm very passionate about, stress and autoimmunity. The things that I've talked to you all about so far, this is stuff that we talk to our patients about in clinic every single day. I talk on these topics daily with my patients, and today I saw 11 patients before coming here, and I talk to all of them about at least one aspect of this talk. This is the biggest one that I talk to them about, though. So there is, an asso without this data even, there is a strong association of stress with autoimmune disease. Forget all of the research. If you think about it, you're stressed out. It messes with you no matter what. You're stressed, stressed about a flight. Something happens to your body. You know that something happens to your body. You feel it. Somebody gets an upset stomach. Somebody gets diarrhea. Somebody's sweating more. This is your body's response to this. It does affect your immune system. So this is a population and sibling match retrospective cohort looking at over 100,000 people with a stress-related disorder. What they wanted to look at here was the hazards ratio of 41 autoimmune diseases at least one year after they were diagnosed with a stress-related disorder. So what they, what they ended up finding was that patients did, if they had an, ex, an exposure to a stress-related disorder, they had a greater risk of, of some subsequent autoimmune disease. And that was compared to matched individuals who had, un, who had no exposure to a stress-related disorder and full siblings. So there is definitely an association. It's that same concept of you might have a genetic predisposition, but there is something that tips the immune system over. In this article, looking at the effects of acute psychological stress on circulating uh, inflammatory markers, this is a meta-analysis. and essentially just summarizing it. It was 34 studies and they looked at circulating cytokine levels at individuals who had psychological stress, acute psychological stress. Um, they found that there was an association of stress with increased IL-1 beta, IL-6, IL-10, and TNF-alpha, so pro-inflammatory cytokines. They, they literally measured their blood and they found that they have high pro-inflammatory cytokines in their blood based on acute psychological stress. So, this is kind of the call for action that stressor-evoked inflammatory mediator reactivity has implications for long-term health. This is basically just saying mental health matters. This is a big deal. Stress is a big deal. I don't think we talk about it enough with our patients. 
and it really impacts them. It may not, they might not even have an autoimmune disease yet, but their stress can trigger it. Finally, before Micah gets started on his talk, I want to just mention, this. so this is a review of immune, um, immune effects of biological stress responses that can be induced by psychological, physiological, or physical stressors. And what they concluded was short-term stress can be okay, not a big deal. It might even be protective because it enhances your innate and adaptive immune response. But when you have too much stress, then that balancing, the beam that I was showing you there, you, you've got at some point now, too much stress is going to result in too much pro-inflammatory cytokine activity and not enough anti-inflammatory activity. That's all for my portion. Now I'll have Micah come up and then we can take questions at the end. Thank you. So next we'll be talking about the autoimmunity and the gut microbiome. So objectives of this section will be looking at the connection between the gut microbiome and autoimmune disease, as well as looking at the different foods we should be eating, anti-inflammatory versus pro-inflammatory pro foods. So the gut microbiome has several functions, nutrient metabolism, drug metabolism, antimicrobial protection, as well as immunomodulation. Today, we'll be touching on the left side of the screen, which is nutrient metabolism and immunomodulation. So the microbiome is affected by many factors. Some we can control, some we cannot. We can't control how we get born, what's our age, our genetics, or if, even if we get an infection. But there are certain factors that we can control that can affect our microbiome, which is diet, stress, our sleep, and our exercise. And when those are in balance, they affect your gut microbiome. And if you have a genetic predisposition and you're out of balance, then you can induce autoimmune disease. There's a term called gut dysbiosis, which means your gut microbiota is out of balance. And we find this in several autoimmune diseases in rheumatology, such as lupus, ankylosing spondylitis, all the way to different vasculitides. So in order to understand the gut microbiome and its association with autoimmune disease, we first have to look and talk about short-chain fatty acids. So short-chain fatty acids are fatty acids with six carbons on it. And what short-chain fatty acids can do is stimulate mucus production, IgA production, and tissue repair in the gut. On the bottom half of the screen is the immune system uh, that's at the gut. And we'll be talking about that in the next couple of slides. In order to generate short-chain fatty acids, you have to eat dietary fiber, which is underappreciated in America. And when you eat fiber, dietary fiber, it interacts with the gut microbiota, and that generates short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids, when you eat dietary fiber, it breaks down to monosaturides, and through a series of biochemical pathways, it generates three key short-chain fatty acids, acetate, butyrate, and propionate. Short-chain fatty acids not only have an effect at the gut, but also systemically as well. It can affect your lungs, your fat cells, your brains, your liver, pancreas, and bone marrow. And these are just some examples of what it can do for our body. So let's zoom into the gut microbiota. So at the gut, when you eat a highly inflammatory diet, such as a Western, standard westernized diet, it talks to your gut microbiome, and then it can induce autoimmunity if you have a genetic predisposition. It will go through the T helper 17 pathway, which is your, your pro-inflammatory T cells, and it can blunt the effect of T regulatory cells, which are your anti-inflammatory T cells. So there's a balance between those two. Remember. T regulatory cells are anti-inflammatory, and T helper 17 cells are pro-inflammatory. So let's zoom out a little bit and talk about the gut. So who here has heard of leaky gut? Many of you. So the way a leaky gut works, so our gut lining has one cell line that separates our gut lumen from our immune system at the pyrus patches. 
when we eat a highly westernized inflammatory diet or when there's stress, your cell line, where one cell line can be separated. All the cells are connected by tight junctions. Those tight junctions can be broken. And when that happens, your small bacteria, small food particles can leak through and start interacting with the immune system in a pathogenic manner as, as demonstrated by the red box there. And then that can lead to increase of T helper 17 cells, which remember are your pro-inflammatory T cells. However, if you eat dietary fiber, as indicated there by butyrate on the left side of the screen, that's one of the short chain fatty acids, that can increase your T regulatory cells. So our patients have the ability to decrease their inflammation of their body through diet. Let's zoom out even more. So if you have the pregenitive disposition and you eat, you have a bad lifestyle, you, you don't exercise, you take a lot of different medications that might um, cause uh, in increased intestinal permeability, you eat a highly inflammatory diet, then those inflammatory cytokines can go out to the lymph nodes and through systemic circulation can start going out to the different parts of our body. And with this, along with a decrease of immune tolerance, molecular mimicry, and epitope spreading, that is a recipe for autoimmune disease. So Dr. Sandu touched on this already, but our, not only is our microbiome at the gut and the intestine involved, but also in the oral microbiome already. So I'm not gonna go through this much, but know that the oral microbiome in the mouth is also involved. So besides what I've talked about, epigenetics gene expression is also very important in the induction of autoimmune disease in rheumatology. There's something called histone deacetylase, which helps control um, gene expression. And when you eat dietary fiber, that increases short chain fatty acids and that can block histone deacetylase, and that can lead to an anti-inflammatory cascade, as seen on the left side of the screen. However, in autoimmune disease, when you have gut dysbiosis, you don't eat enough dietary fiber or fibronutrients, and you have a decrease in barrier function, that will increase histone deacetylase and lead to an increase of inflammation in the body. This has been studied in rheumatology. They've used medications to stop histone deacetylase. And then what they found was that there's been the decrease of rheumatoid arthritis activity. And there's also foods that can block histone deacetylase naturally. These are all fruits and vegetables. Through the phytonutrients, it can block histone deacetylase. So that's the gut microbiome. So next we'll be diving into anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory foods. So each color on the screen you see here has an ability to affect your body through phytonutrients, and we don't eat enough of these. So what should we be telling our patients to eat? What is the evidence out there? There's so many different diets available. Should patients be eating auto, the autoimmune protocol diet, the carnivore diet, the keto diet, vegan diet, a Mediterranean diet, a whole food plant-based diet, a pescatarian diet, or should they be eating a vegetarian diet? What's the evidence? So let's first talk, talk about the anti-inflammatory foods. These are just examples. So I'll be first one with phytonutrients and then dietary fiber and ending my talk on the anti-inflammatory food section with omega-3 fatty acids. So turmeric, this spice is used in many Asian cultures. It's used in curry. It's very bitter when you eat it alone, so I don't recommend you do that. Turmeric is very popular in media now, in our Western culture. They use it in Band-Aids, they use it in lattes, they even use it in ice cream. But I don't find that very beneficial. They even have books on Amazon you can buy. You can even buy this for your best friend for a total of $21.97 on Amazon. So here at Loma Linda, me and Dr. Sandu are conducting the first ever US study on turmeric and lupus. This has been studied in two other nations in the world, Iran and Indonesia. We're looking at 68 patients. 
with primary endpoints and looking at the lupus activity score. There's been over 6,000 studies done on curcumin, which is the active phytonutrient in turmeric. And what's surprising or interesting is that back in 1998, Shoba et al. found that when you combine black pepper with turmeric, it increased the bioavailability in humans by 2,000%. That's why when you buy turmeric supplements, on the back you'll see pepperin abstract. That's to help with the absorption in your body. Curcumin has different mechanisms for its anti-inflammatory effect. This is just one of them. It can raise the T regulatory cells, which are anti-inflammatory. And remember, T regulatory cells have been found to be decreased in number of autoimmune diseases. And when you raise the T regulatory cells, it can block the effects of the inflammatory pathways. Curcumin has been studied and found to be in different mechanisms. So it can block TNF-alpha inhibitor, uh, interleukin-6, and interleukin-1. We have medications in rheumatology to block all three of these mechanisms. Curcumin has been found to have been studied in different rheumatic diseases and autoimmune disease, as indicated on the left. In rheumatology, we, would, we treat rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and scleroderma specifically. But it's also been studied in multiple sclerosis as well. Another example of an anti-inflammatory phytonutrient is resveratrol. This is the beneficial phytonutrient you find in wine. Resveratrol has been studied in a number of autoimmune diseases as well, as indicated by the box in the top, such as lupus, lupus nephritis, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and psoriasis. It's also been studied at the molecular level as well, as seen here. Uh, by this model, it blunts many inflammatory effects that can cause rheumatoid arthritis, for example. So next, I'll be talking about fiber. We don't get enough fiber in this nation. We're fiber depleted. The USDA recommends that we get at least 25 grams of fiber in women, 38 grams fiber in men, but we only get an average of 10 to 15 grams of fiber in America. Fiber has been studied in the NHANES data up to 2010 over an 11-year period. And what they found was that the higher amount of dietary fiber patients took, the lower their chance of a metabolic syndrome, obesity, and inflammation as measured by C-reactive protein. Dietary fiber has also been studied in rheumatic disease journals. So in this article, they, in this study, they looked at the amount of dietary fiber patients took in association with their knee pain. It was over an eight-year period, and it was through a questionnaire every year. And what they found was that when patients took a higher um, intake of fiber, they had a lower risk of having moderate to severe knee pain. And this was in osteoarthritis patients. And omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids is the next topic. Omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory, and omega-6 fatty acids are pro-inflammatory. When we eat omega-3 fatty acids, those are found in fish, your chia seeds, your flax seeds. In a vegan diet, you can, you're taking omega-3 fatty acids in the form of ALA, alpha-linoic acid, and that's found in chia seeds and flax seeds. Your fish is supply EPA in the middle there and also DHA. So if you're vegan, you have a hard time changing ALA into EPA and DHA. There's only a 10% conversion rate. So they recommend for vegans and vegetarians to take in uh, algae omega-3 fatty acid supplement. And omega-3, as I said, is anti-inflammatory as you see through the pathway in the middle there, and also on the bottom, you'll see resolvents or protectants. Those are cytokines that are anti-inflammatory. So when patients are getting better from a rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, their resolvents and protectants are at work. On the left side of the screen is your omega-6 fatty acid pathway. That's a pro-inflammatory pathway. So when you eat a westernized diet, highly processed food, um, high saturated fat, a lot of vegetable oils, a lot of fried foods, those are highly 
pro-inflammatory and your omega-6 fatty acids go up. So your omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are always trying to be in a balance and you want to emphasize the right side of the screen. So we touched on omega-6 fatty acids. I'll end this section talking about salt and something called advanced glycation end products. So this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. So when we eat an excess amount of salt, we have found that it increases inflammatory cytokines through interleukin-23 and T helper-17 cells. T helper-17 cells, as I mentioned earlier, is pro-inflammatory. So it can induce these different pro-inflammatory cytokines, and we have medications to block every single one, such as anakinra to block interleukin-1, tocilizumab to block interleukin-6, ustekinumab to block interleukin-23, adalumumab to block TNF, and secucunumab to block interleukin-17. Salt in a, in a minimal amount is okay, but when it's in excess, such as our standard American diet, it's too much, and that is pro-inflammatory. Advanced glycation end products is something we don't talk about much, but that is also known as age, and that is when your proteins and fats become linked with sugars. In the Journal of American Lifestyle Medicine, they have found that age, when it attaches to a receptor known as RAGE, can induce inflammation through NF-kappa-beta, and that has been implicated in diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and chronic kidney disease. Different foods can affect age as well. When you cook at a higher temperature, it increases the amount of age. When you, crease, when you cook in a higher moisture, such as boiling food, that decreases the amount of age. They looked at different types of foods at a university, and they found that fried bacon had the most amount of age. They found that, generally, animal products had more than carbohydrates. Vegetables and fruits had the lowest amount. So if you look on the left, a roasted potato didn't have much. But when you make fried foods such as french fries, it increased the amount of age by a lot. Also, processed carbohydrates had the most amount of age in the carbohydrate group. In the fat group, butter had the most amount of age. So emphasize your fruits and vegetables. That's the theme today. They also study this in rheumatic diseases. They looked at this in adult onset still disease and lupus. And what they found was that when patients have active adult onset still disease and lupus, they had a minor, higher amount of age, advanced glycation end products in their blood compared to control groups and compared to inactive patients. So that was a lot to take in. So to summarize, we need to shift away from the Western diet and emphasize fruits, vegetables, and fiber. Your anti-inflammatory pathways are linked to omega-3 fatty acids, phytonutrients, and fiber. Everything else has the potential to be pro-inflammatory, such as red meat, sugar, omega-6 fatty acids, saturated fat, and salt. And that can be detrimental to your gut microbiota and induce gut dysbiosis. So take home points. So autoimmune disease stems from a multitude number of factors, including genetics and your lifestyle. Your genetics cannot be controlled, but your habits can, your diet can, and so can your stress levels. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yu and Dr. Sandu. Um, I'm sure there are going to be many questions. The hands are starting to shoot up here. And thank you for being here to answer a question. I will way in the back. You're going to make me work. It's good to keep you limber after you've been running like that yesterday. I've seen patients who have undergone a great stress, particularly women, and they developed a condition after all the tests have done and you eliminate everything else. It's called fibromyalgia. Please discuss what's the cause of treatment of that supposed disease, and it may be real. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, I can try to answer that one. Um, I'm going to start with actually answering based on what I say to my patients because um, I don't think fibromyalgia is a disease and I don't think it's fair that patients get diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And that's, and that's really only on the basis of fibromyalgia is a symptom. That's kind of how I feel. Um, and admittedly, I have patients who I say, this is your fibromyalgia. However, I'm very selective in whom I say that to. And the, and the reason for that is really fibromyalgia means that I have pain and I have pain everywhere, but I don't know why I have pain. And all you docs have done everything you could figure out for what might be the cause of my pain and you couldn't find anything. And therefore it's fibromyalgia. Um, that to me just means that we couldn't figure out what's wrong with you. So that's my only, that's my problem with, with, with really labeling someone with fibromyalgia. So those patients that say, I need something to explain my pain. And I say, well, I don't have an explanation for you, but if you would rather have the label of fibromyalgia as something that's your pain, that's fine. But to me, it's myofascial pain. So that is what I write in their diagnosis, myofascial pain of unclear ideology. Is it related to autoimmune disease? No. And I think there are probably people who can refute that, but I, I do not think that fibromyalgia is an autoimmune disease. It, we have so many patients that come to our, our clinic with a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, and they have vitamin D deficiency, they've got thyroid problems, they've got sleep apnea. So my protocol, actually, I do e-consults, my protocol for anyone who puts in a referral to rheumatology for fibromyalgia, I say, have they had a sleep study? Is their thyroid function normal? Is their vitamin D level normal? All of these things have to be completely normal. There has to be nothing else going on. And if they have joint pain, I always give the same spiel. Your joints are a kinetic chain from your head to your toe, you're fully connected. If you have a problem in your feet, you could have a problem in your shoulders because you're gonna be walking a certain way, it's gonna affect your gait, whatever it is, that can affect your muscles around your joints. So I have a very low threshold to do like x-rays in somebody who's come in with a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. I wanna make sure it's not something else because I actually think it's dangerous to say someone's got fibro and it's all fibro because what if it's something else and we're just labeling somebody with fibromyalgia. Now, on that same note, pain is pain and pain is real. So I don't want to downplay that, oh, well, this isn't, this isn't, you know, this isn't real, this isn't a real disease. That's not actually what I mean to say by that. Pain is pain. We just, as providers, need to be very cognizant about doing a very complete evaluation. This stuff, all the stuff that we were talking about, this relates to fibromyalgia too, because it's pain pathways. And if we're talking about joints, again, if we're all connected from head to toe, if you've got some sort of an issue with your back, you're going to have myofascial pain in all the tender points. If you've got twins like I do, twin toddlers, for a couple of years, I had pain everywhere. I was pretty sure I had fibromyalgia. So it, it's really understanding the basis behind it. In my patients with fibro, I spend a lot of time with them. And I really talk to them about their symptoms, where do they hurt? Tell me what you're doing on a daily basis. What physical activities are you doing? Like, what's going on in your life? What are your psychological stressors? What are your physiological stressors? You're sitting at the computer all day long and you're looking at a computer screen, well, that's gonna cause you to have a lot of pain up here. So just kind of understanding where the pain is and where it pains them the most. I know that's not necessarily this talk, but I think that since we're rheumatologists, that kind of fits in with us. Question over to your left. Uh, any comment on the use of whey in autoimmune diseases? There's been some talk uh, about cow's milk being inflammatory and whey protein is one of the proteins in there. There's been some data I found in literature that casein protein can, um, patients can develop antibodies against it and that could be implicated in inflammation. As far as whey protein, I haven't found much data on that in regards to autoimmune disease so far. But I do advise my patients to stay away from dairy milk um, just because I found that to be beneficial for patients when they do have autoimmune disease. And some of my patients have improved just from cutting out dairy. Question here to your right. Yes, do you have uh, any information or experience using naltrexone for, as an anti-inflammatory? So naltrexone, there's been literature on it that has, helps for fibromyalgia, but at Loma Linda, we don't use naltrexone yet. 
for a problem. You have to get it to a compounding pharmacy, um, and they have to do a special formulation of that. It's a different dose than we have what we have naturally for naltrexone. Another question right here. I have two questions. One is on vitamin D. Um, you've talked about the importance of, of adequate levels. Do, is there, what is the data on supplementing to correct that? I mean, uh, so so it depends on what studies you're looking at. Um, in, in lupus, they actually say at least 40. No, what I'm asking is, do oh, we sorry. have good data that supplementing actually corrects the clinical symptoms yes. associated? Yes, there is. Okay. There is data that has shown that we, we supplement with vitamin D. There is an improvement in these problems that we're discussing. Thank yes. you. My second question was on, uh, I, I heard a, a leap here between turmeric and curcumin. And um, at, at one point you were talking about turmeric and then switching to curcumin, which I know some people think is the active ingredient in other, other studies. I, there was one that showed that they extracted the curcumin and used what was left and it worked as well as the... Yes, so, so curcumin is a main active in, uh, phytonutrient in turmeric. However, there, yeah, you're correct. There are studies that suggest that they, when they took out curcumin, the turmeric um, also helped with inflammation as well. But most of the studies have been done on curcumin. That's why it's the main ingredient that they use. Um, so I always recommend to my patients, try not to take a supplement, take the actual um, vegetable, the fruit, the spice in its um, original form, then you get the whole um, beneficial effect. Because we don't know, sometimes we don't know how these different um, phytonutrients in these fruits and vegetables interact with each other. So when you take out the active ingredient, it might not be as beneficial. Question down in the middle here. Yeah, uh, you, you asked a question in your presentation, you know, which, which diet is the best? You know, I, I, I typically will advise plant-based, but you know, there are some other foods that I've found clinically maybe that are, uh, you know, in pro-inflammatory, for instance, wheat. Um, you know, I, I think wheat sometimes or gluten can be inflammatory. And then also uh, your nightshades group, so uh, potatoes, eggplants, um, bell peppers, uh, and then, of course, dairy, I think, is, is also really seems to be uh, pro-inflammatory. So sometimes I end up recommending like an autoimmune, the, the, there's an autoimmune paleo diet that's out there. Is there a diet that you all kind of go to that, work, that cuts out a lot of the, the pro-inflammatory foods? Yeah, so uh, I always generally recommend a whole food plant-based diet as the foundation. But when, if I wanted my patients to be really, really on an anti-inflammatory diet, I put them on a raw vegan diet um, since that cuts out. Um, the dairy, the wheat, and everything, and I can, over a course of time, add an ingredient of food and see how they react to those different foods. So there is data to suggest that wheat can be inflammatory. Um, there was a paper that found that pa some uh, patients developed antibodies to wheat. And nightshades, there is some data as well. They talk about lectins. Um, that can be, potentially be pro-inflammatory as well. But there's no strong data uh, to suggest this right now, but there's some literature. So it's, it's I would suggest a whole food plant-based diet, and then different patients have different variations depending on genetics and how they react to these different foods. So we have, we have time for a couple. Uh, I just want to add one, I just add one point yes. to that. I think the big thing with diet and giving recommendations to patients is being very realistic. So I tell patients all the time, you have to be realistic. So I do ask them, like, right, what are you willing to do? Because patients will kind of come in not knowing what to ask. So they'll just kind of say, what diet should I be on? And I think the right answer is really, how far are you willing to go? Because you need to be on, if you're going to, if you want to make a change in your diet, it needs to be a realistic change in your diet that you're actually willing to do and sustain long term. So a lot of people will go on a diet that they can do for two weeks or a month, and then it becomes either unaffordable or they lapse into an unrealistic, you know, they lapse into what they were in before. So I always say start with something small. So start by taking out your red meats or you know, if you're eating red meat, because a lot of our patients do eat meat, you're if you're having red meat, start to minimize. Instead of once a week, do it once every two weeks, and then once every month, and then we start doing, this is ideal, what Mike is talking about, but a lot of times we don't have that. It just kind of depends on some being very realistic in what they can and can't do. Because I've tried going organic, it is expensive. So kind of being realistic with your patient and knowing the dem you know, their population, what, where they're at financially, what they're able to do, and what's realistic for them. A few more questions, one back here. 
For people who want to quickly supplement their diet with fiber, there are a lot of different products in the market. Uh, do you guys uh, suggest any more than others? I usually for fiber, I recommend my patients just go to the natural source, which is fruits and vegetables and um, whole grains if possible. I don't have a particular supplement I recommend for fiber. I don't, Dr. Sanjay, do you have a particular supplement? I frequently just say go natural. I don't recommend supplements in general if we, if we don't have to. There was a time when it was claimed that uh, scleroderma might be uh, at least partly due to uh, kind of a, a graft versus host disease and that the reason it's so common in women is because they get some of theirs from the kids uh, uh, lymphocytes leaking through and then taking after mom. Uh, is that still true? Uh, and uh, does that have any therapeutic implications at this point? That's a tough one. Um, there's a lot of, of uh, there are a lot of studies, similar studies in scleroderma specifically. So even uh, breast implants, so silicone implants, and, and the association with onset of scleroderma. I think people still don't know enough. I wish I could tell you more, but unfortunately, we still just don't have the data uh, to explain it because there are people who have silicone and they don't develop it. And then there are people who, a, a group of patients who had scleroderma and all, a lot of them had in common implants. So it's, I don't think we're able to have causation studies just yet. Not enough scleroderma. I knew we would have a lot of questions. Just a few more questions here for you. Does it really matter whether you take vitamin D or D3? Good. Good. <laughs> um, I think it depends on the patient population. So um, there's the, should we be doing an active, the activated form of vitamin D versus like cold calciferol or ergo calciferol? Um, and I think if you don't have underlying kidney disease, if you are able to convert your vitamin D to the activated form, you should be fine. I just check patients' vitamin D levels every three to six months. And if their levels look good, and I'm seeing that they're doing okay, then I don't mess around with what should be what. So I don't have, I don't have a greater explanation for that. Yes. Well, 25-hydroxyvitamin D is what I'm checking, yes, not 125. Level. So that's what I was saying earlier. So it, it kind of depends. So we've got data in lupus that says it should be at least 40. Some people are aiming for 50. Um, yeah, and I think some of our docs here at Loma Linda are also aiming for at least 40, if not above 50. That's Question. not just rheumatology, sorry. That's also in our preventive medicine department. Question is, in the is there anything to the idea that when you're a baby, your intestine's not formed, you know, newborn intestine's not formed, so you have more of a leaky gut? supposedly to absorb the amino immunoglobulins from the mother's milk, but if you introduce the wheat, the casein, the beef, the whatever too soon, those big long chains before they're digested are getting in and then setting off an immune system, um, would you say, uh, like, you know, response or, or like a memory, you know, to those things, so then later in life you're more, uh, tend to be allergic to those things. That's a great question. I don't know the data on that, actually. Um, I know that the way you're born, uh, whether it's through uh, C-section or natural, does play a role in gut, the gut microbiota, and that can be potentially a trigger for future autoimmune disease, but I don't know the data behind your specific question, unfortunately. Dr. Sandu, do you have any input on the question? No, okay. I would, yeah, that was my, I don't know, I'm sorry. We have, That's a great question, by the yeah, way. It's yeah, it's really good. Time for two more questions, okay. one here and then one down in the front. Uh, is soybean product has too much uh, uh, omega-6? Uh, soy is actually anti-inflammatory. Um, I think it depends on the individual, but in general, if you look at the data, soy is actually very beneficial. Um, uh, the, the people that live in the blue zones, which Loma Linda is one of them, I mean, we eat a lot of soy. Um, so people that live longest in the world have um, soy in their diet. So there's, uh, I would say there's omega-3 fatty acids versus more than, more than omega-6 fatty acids in soy products. But of course you want the least processed soy as much as possible. 
So those soy burgers that you buy at the market, those probably have a lot of omega-6 fatty acids because it's <laughs> very, very highly processed. A couple things. One, because vitamin D is more structured like a hormone than other vitamins, right. and because hormones you frequently adjust um, to affect as opposed, because you can have transduction errors and receptor deficits. Uh, anybody adjusting vitamin D levels to how the person is doing instead of the dose to how somebody is doing instead of a level. Second thing is uh, because the uh, curcumin and the other similar derivatives are nutritional supplements, they're in a man manufacturing standards for purity or potency for them. How does one assure oneself that one is getting the equivalent of a USP even if there's not a USP standard? Yeah, yeah sure. So um, as far as the vitamin D goes, um, I can tell you that in general, we focus on levels in general. So making sure your levels are good. Bearing in mind that if I have a, I'm going to keep using lupus as an example because I have a lupus clinic, but um, if I have a lupus patient who continues to have pain and I see evidence of lupus being active otherwise, I'm probably going to keep the vitamin D level as is and treat the lupus with their immune suppressant. However, I do have some patients who I keep giving them their 50,000 units of vitamin D every week and it's almost like they've been, they've been on it for a long time. I've got a, a, a woman who's got autoimmune inner ear disease and she swears to me that when she doesn't take her vitamin D every week, she starts getting ringing in her ears again and it goes away when she takes her vitamin D. So I, I know it's not in the literature, well autoimmune inner ear disease is super rare to begin with, um, but when I hear that from a patient, I really don't care about whether something's in the literature or not, I'm just gonna give it. So yes, I do have some patients that are like that and I just keep giving it. And I'll have, I'll have kind of the staff sometimes will say, well, you didn't renew, you know, you didn't check a vitamin D level, I don't really care at that point. I'll check it every six months, but I'll keep renewing it because I know it makes them feel better. Like they are symptomatically demonstrating improvement on the vitamin D. As far as the supplementation of turmeric is concerned, Studies have shown that two to three grams of turmeric is in, gives you an anti-inflammatory effect. That's why, but it's an association with the black pepper as well. So it's really important when you buy the supplement to buy the ones in the back that says piper and extract in order to get the absorption or else it's not gonna really work as well. Same concept when you cook. When you cook with turmeric, you wanna add black pepper to it so it helps with the absorption. And it kind of goes into we don't have a standard so when you look at the literature for turmeric slash curcumin, it's a range of 10,000 milligrams a day too. So just cancer patients, we see different stuff in cancer, different stuff in rheumatology, different stuff in endocrine, like it's just different across the board. Thank you very, very, very much, Dr. Sandhu and Dr. Yu. I knew that the audience would be very interested in your topic. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you all for staying awake. Thank you.